Two games left in the regular season, and Miami's playoff fate is still undecided. What needs to happen to break right for them to escape the play-in tournament? And with fans frustrated with the team's inconsistency, does Eric Spolster deserve some of the blame? We answer that and much more as we break down the next two games versus the Toronto Raptors on today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg, editor at allyougetheat.com, and joining me as always is credentialed Heat media member David Ramil. However you're tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app, thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. We'll get to how much Eric Spolstra is to blame for what the Heat season has become, but let's start with what's at stake this weekend and the miracle that the Heat need to happen in order to escape the play-in tournament. So, the running line on here, you know, uh, has been that the Heat are going to be in the play-in tournament, even though that there's a small percentage chance that they can actually escape the play-in and end up with a top six seed. And that's still that's still possible, even despite having lost to the Mavericks on Wednesday night, David. So here's what needs to happen. Let's just let's just lay it out there. Slim odds. We're gonna qualify this as a miracle, but this is the this is the path, okay? So first thing that needs to happen, obviously, the Heat need to win their next two regular season games against the Raptors. They host the Raptors on Friday and on Sunday. The Raptors stink. They are actively trying not to win games. There is a top six uh, protected pick on the line for them. They are almost locked into that top six, but they're not quite locked into that top six. So feeling around Toronto is, hey, let's lose these last two games and really make sure that we don't lose you know, a, a pick to the San Antonio Spurs there. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the Magic have to lose in Philadelphia also on Friday. All right. Joel Embiid's back. Tyrese Maxey seems healthy. DeAnthony Melton has returned to the lineup. The Orlando Magic have lost three of their last four games. Very possible that they go into Philadelphia and lose that game. Okay. The third thing that has to happen is that the Magic have to lose to the Milwaukee Bucks in Orlando on Sunday. So the Milwaukee Bucks, by then, that's the last game, that's the last day of the regular season. They could be locked into whatever playoff seed that they have. Right. And if that's the case, do they even travel their vets? We already know that Giannis is going to miss the rest of the regular season, so he's already ruled out for that Sunday game with the calf strain that he has. So like ma the Magic losing to Milwaukee, that might not happen. Like That's not a given at home on a Sunday. So TBD on that. And then the fourth thing that has to happen is that the 76ers then lose to the Brooklyn Nets who also stink on Sunday. So, uh, at home in Philadelphia. So, uh, the, the first two things m more possible than the last two things, but basically all of this would result in the heat magic and Sixers finishing the regular season at 46 and 36. So a three way tie there and the heat would actually get the tiebreaker in this scenario because they would have the better conference record. So there's the route, David. What do you think? I don't think it matters. I think it's very <laughs> unlikely for Miami to be able to have everything break right. And and it's so hard to kind of even foresee what these different outcomes are. Because as you just pointed out, like there's going to be, you, you would think, oh, a very good or a decent Bucks team that's struggling, they should be able to beat a bad Nets team. Well, it doesn't really matter because, well, who knows, you know, or the Magic team. Because they're not going to be playing their veterans more than likely. But at the same time, you have got these guys that are like fighting for their NBA, NBA lives, like G Leaguers, guys that want to have like a, a last game. We, we, we all remember Victor Oladipo scoring, what was it, 50 points against the Orlando 40, Magic years ago? Yeah. Uh, something like that. Like he had a monster game against his former team, the Orlando Magic. And it was a meaningless game. They had sat out. It was the year they had gotten the first seed. He had barely played that season. And he just went out and just, ripped everybody up and it was like wow this is victor oladipo he's gonna be great this is like this i can't believe they buried his guy on the bench and of course you know he wound up incurring another unfortunate injury later on that playing playoff but the reality was that we never really saw that version of oladipo because he was just going up against a, a not even a g league version of the magic at that point he was just dominating against players that were really just trying to get a footing in the nba at all so there's so much going on with these last two games where to some teams it matters, to some teams it doesn't matter. And at the same time, you still have individual players that are looking at these 
as great mm -hmm. opportunities to have these incredible games that no one possibly could have foreseen. So it really makes things very interesting over the last right. couple of days. Like a Malachi Flynn 50 burger. Like these are the things that happened in the last couple of weeks of the season, right? And so, yeah. no, it's a great it's a great point. And, and so this whole thing is very unpredictable, right? Like you could say on paper, you like you could make your, you could look at the route here and on yeah. paper be like, maybe it could happen, right? You could start talking to yourself into it. Like, yeah, Toronto, they're trying to lose games. But like the the player to your point, David, like the players who are actively on this Raptors team, the ones that they haven't basically sidelined with fake or minor injuries. <laughs> yeah, they're to your point. Like this might be the most playing time they ever get in the NBA, right? Absolutely. For some of these guys, the Magic, like they could go into Philadelphia and lose, but also they could be trying to hit the right notes going into the playoffs, right? Like the Magic are trying to make some noise in the postseason, right? They're not just like happy to be here. Um, same goes for that game against the Milwaukee Bucks. And who knows if a guy like, you know, A.J. Green on the Milwaukee Bucks just goes off for 40 Marjan points in that Beauchamp. game. Like, who knows? Yeah, Marjan off Beauchamp, 30 yeah, points. makes yeah, the case to be points. part of the playoff rotation, right? Um, and then, like, the Brooklyn Nets are a whole thing. Like, Cam Thomas could just go off for 60 points on the last <laughs> game of the regular season. Who knows, right? Yeah. And and take down the 76ers. And halfway through the third quarter, they're like, you know what, Joel and Bede, why don't you take the night off? You know, like, get ready for the playoffs. So who knows what can happen? But that's the route. Here's what I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I'm, are you ready for my prediction? I got a prediction. Sure. I'd love to hear it. All right. So looking again at this route. So the Heat are going to beat the Raptors both oh, games. Wait They're a minute. Is the this the return of Nostra Dumbwes? <laughs> it is. Where's my little, uh, I don't know what I did that hat. Um, it's been a couple of years. All right. Here's Nostra Dumbwes. Here we go. So the Heat need to beat the Raptors both games. That's going to happen, David. That's going to happen. They're going to get right. I know they're ignoring the standings, but they're going to be trying to hit the right the right rhythm going into the postseason. They're going to beat both. They're going to win both games Friday and Sunday at home against the Raptors. That's going to happen. The second thing that's going to happen is that the Orlando Magic are going to lose in Philadelphia on Friday night. The Magic, like I said, they're they're slipping right now. Philadelphia's on the upswing with Joel Embiid back, with their guys getting healthy. Philly's going to win that game. Wow. First two things already happened. That's amazing. Nice. I, I think the Magic are going to lose to the Bucks on Sunday. That's a 1 o'clock oh, game. And Sunday is loaded. For people that don't know what the NBA has done here, every East Coast game is played at one. Every <laughs> every yeah. team is playing Friday night and on Sunday night. So all these games are happening Friday night and on Sunday night. No games happening on Saturday. So all the East Coast games are happening at 1 o'clock on Sunday. And then uh, the West Coast games are three are, are happening at 3.30. So, wow. Clear your schedule. Uh, but that's what's happening. <laughs> so the Magic are going to lose to Milwaukee on Sunday. Everything's going to plan. The one the thing that feels like the biggest shoe in is the Sixers uh, losing, or not the biggest shoe in. It, the, the one thing that, I don't know. I just think it's going to come down to the Sixers who need to lose to the Nets on Sunday. They're going to win that game. And I think that's what's going to happen. It's going to be one of those two. It's either the Magic are going to beat the Bucks when they're not supposed to, or the Sixers are going to beat the Nets when they're not supposed to. That Nets team is broken. Like they they had such high expectations at the start of the season, and you know they haven't exactly shaken up that roster. And there are still NBA like quality players on that team. I, I've said it before on Lockdown NBA. I I have no idea. I think that's the biggest mystery of this NBA season. If you can pinpoint just one, is why the the Brooklyn Nets have been as bad as they are because they do have some decent players. I know they had you know there's questions about Shaq Vaughn and everything else, and but at the same time like. There's it's it's so unpredictable. I think it's if anything, it's shown that Mikhail Bridges is probably not a number one option in the NBA. He's not. It's unfortunate because he was on such an upward trajectory, and there was high hopes that he could be that player, and it just hasn't panned out to that in that direction. But who knows? It's gonna come down to like, the final I mean, day, and it's gonna be I, I like heartbreaking. The, that, <laughs> yeah, and that's Heat fans, you should put it together a graphic with like the three, like a checklist there, and have them all checked off, and then that fourth one with a big unfortunate, you know, it'd be classic Heat, right? Once you think you're out, they pull you back in. Right, they're gonna win these two Toronto games. Everything else is gonna go right, and then one of those last games on Sunday, that's gonna be the breaking point. That's gonna be the one thing that didn't go right that they needed to go right. Too little, too late. It just feels like that's where we're headed. Um, nice. Speaking of this Miami Heat season, if it has been like that, who's to blame for it, and how much is Eric Spolstra actually to blame for the way the Heat season has gone? We'll get to that next here on Locked On Heat. Today's episode of Locked On Heat is brought to you by our friends at 
Stitch Fix. You know that instant confidence boost you get from an outfit that makes you look really good? That's what you get with Stitch Fix. Easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist that helps you find new on-trend favorites that are going to work for you. Give your stylist your size, style, your budget preferences, and then order boxes when you want, how you want, with no subscription required. And they send five just-for-you pieces, plus outfit recommendations and pro styling advice to help you put on the clothes that in a way that makes sense. You keep what works. You send back what you don't want. Your stylist always sends you the just the right pieces that you need. The fit is going to be on point. It's like having your own private stylist. You know how these NBA players have their stylists laying out their clothes on the bed in the hotels the, the, for, for, for their game day fashion walk? You basically get to have that with Stitch Fix. Stitch, make, Stitch Fix makes it all so easy. If you don't like the shop, they save you time. They save you the effort. Plus, you get outfits that make you look good and feel good. So it looks like you know what you're doing. If you don't love something, you just send it back. Shipping returns and exchanges are always free. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on. Stitchfix.com slash locked on. Today's episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions to apply, and eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you're subscribed in you on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. We are... So close to 13,000 subscribers. So if you haven't found us on YouTube yet, check us out. Hit that subscribe button. Really does go a long way for us uh, as we continue to build things here. Um, all right. So not quite blame pie here, David, but after last night's loss, I think some people are starting to point the finger, strangely enough, in my opinion, at Eric Spolstra. And when you look at how this season has gone and... I know we don't know the totality of it. I know we don't know the results. I know we don't even know whether or not the Heat are going to be in this play-in tournament or not, even though the odds are increasingly that they are going to be in this 7-8 game at the very least. Um, and then whatever happens after that, we don't know, right? Like, they could go on another... They could rip off a, po uh, a postseason run like they did last year. Like, who knows? But it doesn't change what we have seen, and it doesn't change everything that has happened to this point. And everything that has happened to this point, right, I think is a disappointment. I don't think that there's any way to kind of <laughs> spin that other sure, than right, yeah. this team was in the NBA Finals last year. Everybody expected them to not be in the play-in tournament last year. They were. They know, Nobody expected them to be in the play-in tournament again this year, and they were. And a team that was in the Finals last year with the payroll that this Heat team has ought to not be in the play-in tournament. So this part has been a disappointment. We could talk about injuries. We've talked about it enough throughout the season. We have pointed the finger at Jimmy Butler quite a lot, but we put the poll out there on the Locked on Heat Twitter account. Does Eric Spolster deserve a lot of the blame for this season? 46% of you said yes. 54% of you said no. So pretty close to down the middle. And David, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that anybody would look at the way this season has played out and be able to say that Eric Spolstra is got like a lion's share of responsibility for what's happened here. I'm not, I think it's just the way the sports landscape has evolved over the last 20 years or so, maybe even longer than that. We really think about it. You know, it can't be the players. It can't be what's going on. You can point to those things. You see them, you see what players do much more clearly. And when you have a season like this one, that's so inexplicable, in terms of, well, they look like they should be good enough and, and you kind of gravitate towards these players that you're really fans of, what's the big X factor that you really don't see? You don't see what Eric Spolster does behind the scenes. You don't see how he coaches this team. All you see is, well, he's not putting in this player. He's not putting in that player. 
and it breaks down to well he's not doing his job in that sense and so it's just easy to point the finger at the one person that you can't really determine what it is they do we spend all this time during the whole regular season during last postseason saying eric spolster might be miami's biggest and best x factor and i don't know that the general fan understands that they they don't really care they they think oh yeah I suppose had some success but even then i think on a, on a much more basic level it's like well if he's that good a coach why doesn't he always win like i think it's part of the the idea of you know phil jackson and michael jordan and maybe that's going back much further but you look at phil jackson his winning ways well he won a lot of games he won championships every time he was in the finals with michael jordan and it's like well maybe it's a chicken and the egg type argument who gets the credit for that phil jackson absolutely did a great job with that roster but he had a really good historically good roster in the process and he also had a really good roster when he was with the los angeles lakers everybody kind of forgets the years in between where he kind of struggled where they didn't have either kobe bryant at his peak or michael jordan at his peak and kind of takes away from how good you are you look at what greg popovich is doing right now like five years ago maybe a little bit longer than that six years ago you wouldn't have questioned whether or not Popovich was one of the greats of the game. And now everybody's like, well, are they, is he really that good? Does he really even know what he's doing? As if he somehow had forgotten everything he knew about basketball, which is much more than your, your 1,000 or 2,000 basketball fans combined. And somehow he's, he's forgotten all of that as his team continues to lose. So I, I'm not surprised that people blame Spolstra. I don't think he's been perfect in managing either the roster or in terms of how the offense has played out. But I think we tend to kind of overstate how important it is during the regular season, coaching that is. And then at the same time during the postseason, it's where I think those kind of switches, the changes that you make, the tweaks that you do, that's where it really magnifies, much like for a lot of players, it magnifies what coaches do over the sense of like a seven game series. And, and so, I think we'll, you know, if we ran this poll at the end of last postseason, after he guided and guides that team to the postseason, how many people would say that Eric Spolster was to blame for a season that has played out very similarly, you know, eerily similar to this one? You know, was he responsible for last regular season being really crappy and somehow also responsible for last postseason being really good? You know, it's just, it's too convenient an argument that I think kind of erases all sense of nuance. Mm. So I don't know. Um, yeah, what that's kind of where I'm at right now. I think he's. I think he shouldn't get the blame that a lot yeah. of people are heaping his way. You know where I stand. Um, I'm at this point probably an Eric Spolstra apologist, but I also think that he's by far the best coach in the NBA. <laughs> Apologizing for everybody, yeah. Who else? Hero, <laughs> uh, hero, Tyler. hero, and Spo. Those are my guys. Yeah, yeah. Hero, Jimmy Spoh, Butler, like Duncan Robinson, Jimmy Butler. I am yeah. not an apologist. I am maybe overly <laughs> critical of Jimmy Butler, if anything, but. Um, I, like I said, I don't know how you look at this season and, and blame Eric Spolstra for, for how it's gone to the degree of, of where it's gone. Like, yeah, could he have did a couple mistakes here and there, a couple of things here and there. Could he squeezed out a couple of more wins? Sure. Probably. But when you're talking about, when you look at the list of things that went wrong this season and people who deserve most blame, Eric Spolstra might be on the list. But he's not near the top of it, right? Like, number one is injuries. Let's just be real. Like, Eric Spolstra, and part of it, the part of, I think, Spo's problem, at least when we talk about the fans and the way they view him, is, like, you mentioned Phil Jackson, right? Like, the best thing that ever happened to Phil Jackson was him talking about the triangle to anybody mm -hmm. with an ear, right? Because now you had, like, Phil Jackson it wasn't even equals... His. And it wasn't even his. Phil Jackson equals triangle equals Michael Jordan wins a championship. Like it was very simple to see the order of operations for a fan, right? And so Eric Spolster doesn't have that. Eric Spolster doesn't have the triangle. Eric Spolster has, we have enough. He's got his endless spoisms. He's got this endless thing. And he has basically brainwashed the fan base to the point of every Heat fan says, we have enough, we have enough. That Haywood Highsmith can go toe to toe yeah. with Jason Tatum, right? And like, that's, like, that's what Heat fans think. And so then when it does not happen, they blame Eric Spolstra. They say, well, we have enough, so why aren't you doing more with the enough that we have that you told us we had? And so it's it kind of works against him in that weird way. Um, yeah. But again, yeah. when you look, when you look, the thing is with the we have enough thing, you don't have enough. 
Like the Heat have had enough this year to be in the play-in tournament. They have not had enough this year based on all the injuries. Fifth most games lost due to injury this season. 35 different starting lineups. Like that stuff does matter. Your best players being on the court and playing like your best players matters in the NBA. Just look at the standings. I don't know why people think that the Miami Heat are immune to how the rest of the world and the rest of the NBA interacts with each other. Like look at the standings. The best players on the best teams who are the healthiest all season are the teams at the top of the standings. They just are. That's the way it works, right? And the Heat have not had their best players available. When they have had them, they haven't played as well as that they need to, meaning mostly Jimmy Butler. And they've lost. They have been so hurt this year. And that's where I just, that's where I'm at with this roster is it might just not be their year based on the yeah. injuries. Like they finally got healthy and then Terry Rozier has this neck problem. Duncan Robinson's <laughs> lower back thing becomes more of an issue. Right? It was like, we just had it, and it's like a salmon slipping through your fingers. You're like, what do I even... It was healthy, and now it's gone. So that's kind of where I'm at with this. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, even as you were talking about the, the the Heat's record and the standings and everything else like that, like if somebody had told you at the beginning of the year that Miami would have 46 wins, I think you'd be pretty okay with that. I don't, I don't think you'd be expecting more than that. In fact, if I recall our preseason predictions... You probably had him at about 46 wins. I probably I think I had him a little higher, like 48, 49. So I was wrong about that. And I don't think you were necessarily as down on this team. It's just it's just the way the season has played out has been a very difficult one for fans, even for media to swallow it and get a full grasp on. You know, it's just very mm -hmm. it's been very difficult because of the injuries, because everything else. In some ways, you could probably make an argument that they've overachieved. If if somebody oh. had said you were gonna Spolster couldn't coach you? of the year case. No, I won't go that far. But <laughs> couldn't you say, you like, I mean, if somebody told you 46 wins and, and somehow they've gone through injuries to Bam, Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler has missed time. They trade Kyle. They'd have 36 different starting lineups. On paper, you'd say, damn, that they're even competing for a playoff spot. That's pretty impressive. And, and well, yeah. here we are now. So I don't know. The I, again, other teams that have lost as many or yeah the other teams that have been as injured as the heat this year they're yeah. at the they're in the lottery right like we're talking like yeah, yeah we're talking like top five charlotte portland like these are the teams that the heat are with in terms of games lost due to injury right like spo track has this great tracker that keeps like a tally of every team's running injury count those are yeah. the teams that the heat are with the only team in even close to playoff contention that is in that bottom five in terms of injury games lost are the Miami Heat. Yeah. Like, they have, it's, in a weird way, overachieved to your point, David. It's a good point. Uh, we're going to continue with this conversation uh, and maybe a couple things that maybe Eric Spolster could have done differently. We're going to do that next here on Locked on Heat. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time of the NBA and the NHL, and baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game because right now new customers – Get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150. Bucks. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, to secure, MVP. and easy to use. That's right. Nikola Jokic what is you... minus 5,000 for MVP. Luka Doncic has moved up to second, uh, overtaking Shea at plus 2,100. Mm. It yeah. doesn't feel like, like we just saw what Luka could do, right? Yeah. At home and in person. Like, it doesn't, I'm not saying Nikola Jokic doesn't deserve MVP, but it doesn't feel like the odds should be that far apart either. I don't know. It's a tough argument to have. Uh, you know, Luka, not quite the same level of playmaking as Jovic. Uh, Jokic. Improved defender. Sorry, Jokic. God, or Jovic, you know. Mistake. Yeah, that's right. He's not <laughs> nearly, he can't, he can't hang with Nikola Jovic. Uh, right. Anyway, I lost my train of thought after that one. But what are you waiting for? Go visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. And make your first bet an automatic win. That's FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Make sure you are subscribed on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. I might vote Luca if I if I had a vote. I think I'm at the point where I would go. I was breaking down the numbers. You're being a contrarian now. I know he's shooting really well, but I mean his numbers really are well. crazy. He's just shooting really well, no doubt. I, I still think that doesn't matter. I still, I mean, I think we saw it even a microcosm of it last night, though. Like you yeah. take Luca out, and Kyrie kind of lights up this team anyway, and carries the team without him. You know, I don't know that 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 Denver team without Nikola Jokic, Jokic, is just a shell of 
the version they are with him out on the floor. At least that's so you're going opinion. on off stuff. I mean, that's fair. That's fair. But I mean, he's, he's scoring like four more points per game than anybody else who qualifies. It's crazy. He puts it up a hell most... of a lot of shots too. And his percentages are great. He's got 61% true shooting percentage. Like, it's not like he's inefficient. You know, he's not just jacking up shots here. Whatever. Yeah. Um, let's get to some of these things. So uh, we posted the poll that we talked about. We got a lot of replies to that poll on Twitter. And I thought, actually, a lot of them making some good points, some different perspectives. I thought we could just sort of go through them, David. Yeah, Break them good. down. All right. So this one I really like. This comes from James underscore Berg on Twitter. The, the poll, as a reminder, asks, does Eric Spolster deserve a lot of the blame for this season? James underscore Berg writes in, not really. Maybe he could have squeezed a few more wins out in hindsight, but the issues are there regardless. Jimmy is aging and or coasting. Bam isn't a true second option. Tyler slash Duncan slash Terry never had time to develop continuity due to injuries. And I think that that's a very fair and balanced point. Like Summation, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much it. I... I just don't think that there was getting over the injuries. And if there was a way to get over the injuries, it would have been Jimmy Butler dragging this team. Like I think about the way that Donovan Mitchell in January dragged the Cavaliers through so many of their injuries and was putting right. up basically the same Monster numbers number. as Shea Gilgis Alexander and like the Jalen Brunson thing that he's been doing lately. Like that was Donovan Mitchell in January and basically most of February until the all-star break. Um, and that's, and, and Cleveland went like, what was it? Like, and then he missed a lot of games that stretch then. or something. Yeah. And then he, yeah, then he broke his nose and then he had like the LeBron villain mask on for a little while. And, um, but that never really happened, right? The heat never got that performance. You think about like players across the league, like the star players, like they'll even Kawhi yeah. with the Clippers. They, they just give you two weeks of just ridiculous all NBA MVP level play. And we never like we and you can go through the top fifteen in the league, and you could probably say for all of those fifteen players, they yeah. gave you a week or two of that, like right. every single one of them, but except for Jimmy Butler, he never gave the Heat that for more than a couple of games in an, at, at a time. It was never a week or two weeks straight, and that even with all the injuries, if the Heat would have just gotten that once this year, they're probably the sixth seed at least. Yes. Um... You know, I will say one thing about Spo, uh, and I'm, it, it kind of uh, cauterized something that we've talked about a lot, and, and even though we talk about while we're covering games in person and, and, and discussing in media road, like the uh, the I can't remember what Twitter site it was that compiled this information and and showed like where head coaches rank in terms of like coaches' challenges. Mm. Did you see this floating around Twitter? I probably should have showed it to I you. I did earlier, see something. Yeah. But I didn't look it, at it, well, you might not be surprised to know that Eric Spolstra ranks dead last, dead last in number of coaches' challenges. He holds on to those. Oh, okay. It's not yeah, not just he, one, just used. Right, right. Okay. No, no. In terms of winning, he's actually slightly above average. I think he's, okay. he's got like a fifty-something percent win rate in terms it's of those. Out. But you know, you don't you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And I think that might be a concern. It's like, you know what? Sometimes sometimes you just got to say, go for it. Like, number one, in terms of, like, uh, shots taken and also – or challenges taken, and, and uh, pretty close in terms of, like, actually winning challenge, Mark Dagenau of, of the Oklahoma City Thunder. And, you know, that's a guy who kind of mm. sounds a lot like Spo in terms of, like, the culture he's trying to build and turn things around. And, I mean, I, has it – could this have turned around, like, a game or two? Like, if you make a challenge at the right spot, can you win a call? I would love to get the mental process from Eric Spolstra about what he thinks of the, I mean, we've kind of joked about it, right? Like that to us and knowing Spo as well as we do and having talked to him and heard from him so often over the years, like I think he just holds on to this because challenges seem like they disrupt the full, the ebb and flow and the purity sure. of the game, whatever it is that he opines about it, you know? Well, but, I think he like, holds on to so him until the, until crunch time. I just, I think he's I get like, it. look, and I and I, I don't really fault him for that. It, it's like why I don't even know why, by the way, that these challenges are available the entire game. It's ridiculous, and I'm not ever going to lobby for any coach to use more challenges because I hate them and they do disrupt the game. And so, if that's oh. really the Spo reason, then I'm on the same page as Spo. Um, these things should only be available in the last five minutes of each half. Like Ooh. it's ridiculous uh, these challenges okay. because in the grand scheme of things, like a ball going out of bounds one way or the other with eight and a half minutes left in the second quarter, it doesn't matter. Like it's not like there's so much time to make well, up you for saw that. So many, 
you saw so many fans kind of be pissed off about the officiating for the last two minute report versus the Indiana Pacers. Is like, could he have challenged the idea that Tyler was fouled in one possession or no. that, that a foul was called at another possession? So he could actually he challenged it. He used his challenge earlier in that Pacers game, which is why he couldn't challenge the Miles Turner one, right? Because <laughs> he challenged something and lost. Uh, you can't challenge the Tyler Hero thing because nothing was called. Right. Which is still the problem there, but like I don't know how you get around that in terms of like now you're just going to challenge stuff that wasn't called like that just seems ridiculous. Um, Sneaker God writes in, yes, his poor rotation and sheer stubbornness when it comes to these horrible lineups at a time have cost them quite a few games. So I just tried to find something that went the opposite. I find it interesting how people could blame Eric Spolster for lineups and rotations. I'm not saying that they've been like a hundred percent like on the nose, but like the players are on the roster or the players on the roster. And I don't like, I, I don't know what else like he could do rotation wise, lineup wise that would make the heat like in the grand scheme of things, a wholly better team. Cause the team is the yeah. team, you know what I mean? So I don't, and the injuries have been the injuries. So I, I don't, I don't know. I I've heard, obviously you hear this argument a lot from fans, but I think to your point, David, and correct me if I'm wrong here or, or feel free to disagree with me. But it, it kind of goes back to your point where it's just like an easy thing for fans to blame is like, well, the rotations are bad. And my joke always is, well, oh, yeah, he should have played LeBron James. I, he didn't realize he had him on the bench. Like, <laughs> it, it's just like the players are the players, right? Like, th these are the, this is what you're dealing with. You know, it, it's funny because I think the, like a lot of things that kind of, again, you know, concretized this idea from fans is, is seeing Thomas Bryant have like some a recent spate of like decent performances. And it's like, see? If he had just played him more, maybe he would have gotten into this groove right. in February and that would have saved Miami's season. Oh, maybe. But, you know, <laughs> you couldn't overlook the fact that he was giving up twice as many points as he was capable of putting up, too. And, and I mean, that's – I mean, I wish it would have been different. Like, I, I still remember sure. the preseason talk that Miami has the best backup center in the NBA, et cetera. And it just didn't work out that way. So, I don't know. It's, it's tough. You, you have to – you kind of hope for the best. Would I have liked some DeLon Wright minutes here and there scattered throughout the process? Mm. Sure, because I think defensively, he's a much better option than Patty Mills. There's this confidence in Mills that I, I don't know is I don't know what it is, to be honest with you. Um, maybe it's just respect from a veteran player. But like he did this with Kevin Love last year when, when Kevin was basically unplayable. And now a year later, hell, that guy's been like a huge factor for, in Miami's success. Whatever the success they've achieved this year, you know, some of it can be at least attributed to Kevin Love. And I don't know if it's just mm -hmm. kind of springboarding off of last year and suppose unwarranted faith in him. Who's to say that Patty Mills won't have an amazing bounce back next season with Miami? Yeah, if he's around. Um, <laughs> that's it for us. Uh, two more games left. Toronto Friday night, Toronto on Sunday. We will be back. After that game on Sunday, we'll probably wait until all the other games are wrapped up too, just to make sure that we know exactly what's going on with that playing tournament, whether or not Miami's miracle happened. But for now, thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app.